Well, gang, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's so good that we're getting together for this very important study. I know some of us have not had a chance even to open the book yet um, because oh, we haven't have gotten in our class. <laughs> um, I know I had to resort to an audible um, because because we just didn't get our order in as quickly. So um, now that I know who's on the call, um, I will make sure that Deb reaches out to you all and let you know when we get the books into the church office. Um, <laughs> yeah. Or like some of you said, you know, some of you have made your own order. Um, that that's fine if you want to do a Kindle or a Nook or something like that. So Ken and I have kind of framed the class today um, with an understanding that we, we're at all different points with the material right, right now. Um, and, and that's just fine. That's just fine. Um, let's just um, go around real quickly just to introduce ourselves because we don't have too big of a group. And, um, and just if you would, I'll, I'll call your name, by the way, I see you on the Brady Bunch panel here. And um, if you would just share your name and... Um, and just, just real briefly, just, just a sentence. Um, why are you, why are you joining us for this study? Um, okay, that's Katie again. So thanks, Pat. Yeah. So Arilla, Arilla. My name is Arilla Woodburn, and I'm drawn to this because my granddaughter and her mother are black, and I want to be able to support them. Thank you, Arilla. Carolyn. I think I have a lot to learn. And, and same here. I haven't done a lot of time thinking about this subject, so this is an opportunity to look into it. Thanks. Pam? Yes, I'm here to learn and to have my eyes opened. Great. And Ken? Um, I actually have this the same reason um, I, I want to share in conversation about racism. Thanks, Ken. And Camille? Um, I'm a little in the same boat as Arilla. My boyfriend is black and he's an ex-cop. And so I'm wanting to learn how different people look at this, um, what we're going through right now and how they have seen <laughs> racism in the past and what, where they're going with it now. Thanks, Camille. Mm -hmm. Mindy, I I guess I've I've done a good bit of I'm Lynn Reed, and I've done a good bit of reading, but I I want to know what I can do. Yeah, that's. Um, I just feel sort of here we are in this white island, and and I want to be able to do a little bit more. Thanks. Welcome, Katie and Jack. Um, we're, we're just, um, just saying our names as I'm calling them out and, and why we're joining the study in a sentence. So we'll let you guys kind of acclimate for a second and we'll get to you in just a minute. And Sue? Uh, Sue Klassen, I've read a couple of books from the black perspective and I thought I ought to have at least one from the white perspective. Okay, good, thanks. Kathy? Uh, yes, my name is Kathy Chrysler, and a number of years ago when I first read about the talk that uh, black families have with their pre-adolescent kids, uh, boys in particular, I became fascinated with the idea of white privilege, and I, I, I don't know that I feel what that is, but I know there's a lot I can learn about that, so that's why I'm here. Thank you. Mary Jane? I grew up in Maryland, um, never went to school with Blacks, um, had worked with some, and, and thoroughly enjoyed them, but I'm here to learn. Thanks, Mary Jane. And Katie? Hi, Katie Johnson. I, I echo whatever others have said. I just want the opportunity to learn more. Um, we'll be coming a little I think I... I had I, the opportunity to read a lot of black literature when I was in college. It was in the early seventies. Um, and I had a couple of black literature classes, but I feel I just need to get updated information and perspective. I mean, that's a long time ago. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. We're re revisiting this from many, many uh, life experiences for sure. Linda, Marsha. Um, your sermon a couple of weeks ago prompted me to 
realize that I would like to think that I'm not a racist, but your concept of a recovering racist, <laughs> I'm in recovery and I keep learning more and more and to have an opportunity to be in conversation with other folks from Arvada Church really was important to keep unpacking what that means. Thank Thanks, you. Linda. Lynn? I am not Steve, but I am Lynn Kendall. <laughs> and, um, I heard about this book on NPR and listened to the author, and it piqued my interest about a month ago, as well as I'm hoping it I'm not very good with conversation and I want to say debate, but that this will allow me to add to that. Great. Thanks so much. And Jack and Catherine joining us from Minnesota? Yeah, we decided that we'd just see what you Colorado people were doing. <laughs> Checking up on us, huh, Jack? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so why are you both joining the study? Well, um, due to the current events, I had been online looking at books, and uh, this one interested me greatly, and I had uh, put an order in, not available yet, uh, and so there you were choosing the book. So I thought that was pretty wonderful. I'm here because of current events. It's an area I know little about. I say to myself when I look in the mirror, I'm not a racist, but I have a feeling that others would perhaps disagree. So Thanks, we'll see. Jack. Thanks, Jack. And Katie. Hold on, you're muted. I'll unmute you. I think I can. No, you can't. I don't know if you can. If she's muted on her computer, she probably can't. No, it's down to. the lower left corner, Katie, or the upper right corner. Or press the space bar. Or press the space bar. Sorry, I, um, I keep losing the screen. Um, so we studied this book in our book study, in our book club. And then we did Why We're So Polarized, the book, Why We're So Polarized. We did two in a row, which is almost too much. Um, so we studied it quickly, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to do it more slowly and thoughtfully. Well, thanks. I, yeah, I was glad when you told me that you'd already done one in the book study. That'll, that'll be a great contribution to our conversation. So, gang, today, um, so we, we plan the class sessions for an hour and a half from 7 to 8.30, and um, we have a, a PowerPoint that I'll screen share with you that will kind of take us through our time together. Um, but before we get to that, we just want to kind of go over the, the Zoom protocols. I think most of us are getting really good at Zoom by now. Um, but just a reminder that along either the bottom or the upper um, scroll bar of your Zoom screen, there's a couple features. One is, of course, the opportunity to mute or to stop video. And if you start to have um, connectivity issues with your Wi-Fi, sometimes it's helpful to turn off your video and just use your uh, microphone. But it doesn't look like we're having anybody with problems there yet. Um, if when you're not talking, if you could go ahead and mute, that way um, we don't have folks, you know, that get ambient background noise and that helps a little bit. Um, but if you forget, that's okay too. But just as a reminder, that'll help a little bit. Um, our chat function along the bottom, if you click that, off to the right side of your screen, you'll see a participant list. And at the very bottom, you can chat to one another. And a part of our time at the end of the day um, will be to kind of end our session with what have I learned um, what am I going to do this week based on some of the information I've learned? Um, if you want to share that in the chat, you can see how you can click on everyone. It should be preset on everyone. If you click on that everyone and, and hit the arrow, you can actually do a one-on-one -on -one chat with people if you want to do that too. Um, but you can click on everyone and then type a message. Um, I'll put... Um, I'll put a message there. You can see how it says from Amy to everyone. 
And, and so when we do our chat at the end of our session, um, that's how you can, you can make a chat happen. Share screen is going to be the way that I'm going to put the PowerPoint presentation up. And, um, and I, I have the, the host authority, if you will, to, to shift through that. If you try to click on that or, or move it, you can't do that. Only the host can. So um, let me know if we're going too fast or if you need. Sometimes if people want a screenshot, um, one good thing you can do is take a picture of it. Um, if you want to hang on to that note or that reference. And also a part of recording this session, we'll be putting this on the website. It will also capture that PowerPoint. In addition to that, we will upload the recording of this class and the PowerPoint um, itself. So if you want to go through the PowerPoint again, that'll be, that'll be available through the website, um, www.arvadaumc.org slash faith and race. Um, we're going to do in just a minute, we're going to do breakout rooms. Raise your hand if you've done a breakout room on Zoom. Just a couple of us. So it's, it's like a small group room where instead of us going places, we just get put into a small group. And uh, we'll have 30 minutes in our small group with some questions. And so that's what a breakout room is. Um, you can make a reaction. If you click on that, you can make a reaction with um, a happy face, a sad face, whatever. I don't use those very much. But um, so that's some of the protocol. But I think the most important thing is just if you want to mute when you're not talking, if you feel confident doing that, it'll help us with background noise. I want us to just get started first of all. Let me offer a word of prayer and then uh, anxious for you to get to know Ken a little bit more too. So let's pray. God, we give you thanks for helping us be hand in hand with one another as we step into uncomfortable places, places of learning and growing and stretching that take us from what we know into what we can know and what is possible to know by your grace. We're grateful for learning spaces and a faith that encourages us to teach and to, to be taught and to learn together and to grow with one another and an assumption always that um, we're going on to perfection and growing in grace and faith because of your great invitation to us and the love of Christ. So thank you for this time and for this learning space together and for this community who grows and learns with us in Jesus name. Amen. So you all probably know more than I do because I've just had the privilege of getting to know Ken um, for about a year and a half again, though I, I think we've decided somewhere, Ken, through GBHEM and things that our paths some, somehow probably uh, crossed each other in the years past. But even before I knew that I was coming to Arvada, um, a friend of mine hosted a dinner party um, at which Ken and Kathy were at, not, at, that I was at, and then lo and behold, I get to Arvada, and they're here. That was very cool. So um, we are so grateful to have such a treasure in Ken and his experience and scholarship around this conversation, and he has agreed to co-facilitate this study with me, and um, I'm very grateful. How many of you had a chance to take the class that Ken and Pastor Eric did about a year ago, or more than a year ago now? A couple of you? Good. So you already know that the treasure that Ken is among us to teach us some of these important things and, and walk with us. So Ken, would love you to share a little bit about um, your interest in the conversation and, and some of the life experience that brings you to this place. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. And um, I share the excitement of having you as my pastor. So I'm glad for that. Uh, those of, I, I was trying to remember whether I talked about this when Eric and I uh, had a gathering about racism. And I can't remember, but uh, I'm going to go back to what was for me the most um, just uh, formative uh, time of saying, okay, racism is something that I want to give some of my life to trying to do something about seriously. And uh, that was in 1980. I was the pastor of a little church in Maryland, on the eastern shore of Maryland. And uh, this was a rural, um, rural area, a, a small Methodist church. We'd have, you know, but, 150 people be a huge gathering for anything that, that happened there. 
And uh, so it just happened that the Ku Klux Klan decided to have a rally. And uh, there was a member who had a farm um, near the community, in the outskirts of the community. And so he volunteered and there was a public that was well, fairly well publicized uh, that they were planning to have a Klan rally there. The uh, result of that was that as the Methodist pastor, I was involved with um, other community leaders and uh, with other pastors in particular, this in, in this area, churches were segregated. And so I served a white church and there was an African-American church on the edge of town. My church was in the center of, of town. And uh, the two churches started right away working on how we were gonna respond to this. Uh, because of the publicness of, our, of my uh, participation in um, just working to make a, a statement that the Klan did not represent the community and that we were working uh, together, black and white people, to make that clear that, this, that the Klan was not, um, not representative and, and not even welcome in our community. There were a lot of things that happened, like uh, uh, I was out visiting a parishioner and KKK was scratched in the windshield of my car. We got up one morning and there was sugar in the gas tank. We had a, a celebration uh, at the same time that the Klan was meeting. We had a community celebration at, at the Black church. And after the Klan had their rally, they came by the church and burned a cross on the lawn uh, of the church. Um, uh, uh, but what, what was really in many ways transformative for me was the night, one of the nights uh, that I got a phone call in the middle of the night. I think it was probably around two o'clock in the morning and there was answered the phone as pastors uh, do. And the call was just an anonymous call that said, well, we know that you have two small daughters. We, <laughs> we had uh, a daughter that was in, in uh, preschool and a daughter that was in first grade at the time. And as the caller says, well, we, certainly you wouldn't want anything to happen to one of your children and that um, you need to stop speaking against the clan. And then they hung, hung up. And I, at that moment, I, I realized what the kind of experience it is to feel threatened uh, because, of race, because of race. And although I I certainly don't uh, know what it is to be black in America. I know what it is to constantly be on, uh, aware of what's happening with race, the people that are around you, who is it that's, um, that's kind of watching you and what are, what are, they, what are they doing or what might they, might they do? And, the, and that that um, is, um, that no one, sh no one should have to live in that kind of a uh, country where there is uh, racial intimidation and, and uh, threatening and where, where there's a whole a segment of our population that's constantly um, under threat. Um, uh, we, uh, we decided that we weren't going to send our daughters away or that we weren't going to move away or that we, we were, weren't going to tell our daughters that, well, the Klan threatened us and we, we went um, into hiding. And that's really the commitment then that, that, that the racism can't just be um, forgotten or, uh, or, or um, run away from, that it's, it's here with us. Thanks so much, Ken, and, and for um, being in a vulnerable space to share that story. And, and I know Ken's commitment and mine is that, that we create a, a safe space where hopefully we can lean into some of the other stories that, that we've lived and learned from in our own lives. Um, and uh, hopefully that'll be something that can evolve as we grow together and learn together. Thanks so much. Let me, uh, I'm going to screen share just our outline here a little bit so you can see um, 
some of our thoughts for our study today. Um, hopefully, can it, um, is there anyone who can't see the screen share? And you, um, on the right side of your screen, you can make, you can, um, above the Brady Bunch pictures, you can just see your, the speaker, you can see everybody, you can see just the top line of folks, however you'd like to do that. But this is just kind of a, a housekeeping beginning of a class um, material now. So first of all, some things that you might want to bring with you to the um, class sessions every week. First of all, your book or your notes. Um, if you're doing an audio book like I am, you might be taking notes. Um, you might want to be able to write, to the, write in the book or refer to pages in the book or your notes. We really encourage you to, to keep a journal as you're reading. And, and as you're sparked into some thinking or some questions, um, just letting that be a space where, where you can do some kind of internal introspection as we're doing some external outward expression together. Always bring an open mind and heart. And um, I invite you, as I have too, to pray before our time together and just ask the Spirit to get you ready for some new, um, some new awarenesses. This is our learning objective and um, don't need to belabor this a whole lot, but, but it's really important as an educator that I think we start off with, with a goal of how we want to learn and grow together. Um, we want to create a safe place to be nudged into uncomfortable decision or discussions and feelings with awareness, understanding, speaking about it, acting out of our frameworks of white privilege. So obviously if we're going to have a learning objective about understanding our white privilege, we're going to have to learn what that is. We will. And also stereotypes as we grow to become more racially sensitive individuals and part of a Christian community. This is a, a class that we want to help us grow not only as individuals, but a more faithful and racially inclusive and sensitive church. And I'm so glad that this group is here because you all are going to help us do that. These are some just um, ideas around um, how we can create a, that safe space for uncomfortable discussions and learnings um, that comes with this study and just would invite you to, I'm going to pause for just a minute and invite you just to read this carefully and let us know if there's anything that feels like this isn't something I can do or any questions you want to speak to. As you look at those, I especially want to call attention to the last three, because um, I think the, these are really important, especially to this work and conversation, to expect and accept non-closure, because the work of disrupting racism is ongoing, and I would say lifelong. Um, so I, I, if you're someone who kind of needs a bow on it at the end of a class session, this may, this may feel a little uncomfortable because we may not always have a bow on it. There may be a lingering question or a lingering idea for which there is not a quick and easy answer. It's just got to sit with us and sit on us for the week. And so would invite you to be willing to kind of lean into some of that space. Um, the second to the last one, be willing to be challenged to disrupt racist patterns, um, both by the activities and discussions and by other participants. We're going to not only think through and kind of be challenged in our own racial thinking, but also we're going to learn how to help and work, walk with others in their racist thinking. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that work together and learn how to do that. And then this last one, Ken and I um, lifted up is really important. Know that if you want something kept confidential, state that and know that we will respect that. That's really important um, because some of what has kept racial bias and white privilege as a systemic reality is that we don't talk about it. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And so if, if we say, well, this whole thing's confidential, we, we kind of veil ourselves in, in this protective um, web, if you will, that keeps us from really talking about hard things. And so, but it, however, if, if there's someone that really feels like, hey, I've shared something 
confidentially, um, and I need that to be kept confidential. Recognize, first of all, that we are recording our session, <laughs> um, but, but especially in our small group breakouts, if there's a time, please let folks know, and we can help honor that. For our centering moment, each week, I'm just going to have a quote, a scripture, um, something like that, and I invite you to, to find a piece of paper or open your journal or, or page of your book, and, um, and just to kind of get ourselves centered into the conversation, you know, we've, we've had Father's Day and, and others of us have had different things filling up our Sunday today. Um, I invite you just to start kind of narrowing the focus now into the topic that at hand and just invite you to read this silently and then just spend about two or three minutes jotting down any thoughts that come to your mind that help you to kind of center and focus to get ready for our conversation. So um, I'll be quiet, and if you want to read that, you can go ahead and minimize the, um, the frames of the people that you see, the pictures you see, um, so that you can read the whole quote. And let's just spend about three minutes doing some centering ourselves on, on this idea from Toni Morrison. Okay, this might be a, a phrase or a verse you want to come back to, um, even as you kind of um, revisit the information on the video or the PowerPoint another time. And sometimes I find when I start off with a centering um, image and then come back to it, I realize I'm already encountering it as a new learner. So it might be something to think about. Okay, we're going to go into breakout sessions and um, what we're going to do, and this is going to be this is going to be something I'm going to try to do as I'm um, as I'm keeping this up. But just in case, uh, you might want to especially jot out um, the the second and third question. The first question actually comes out of a study guide with white fragility, and it, it talks about highlighting a passage from chapter one. It really gives you some discomfort and, and revisiting that passage as you learn through this book. Um, so some of us don't have the book yet, so you can't do that yet, but that's something to think about. But for, for our breakout session, which will be about um, 25 minutes, um, Ken and I will be facilitating the breakout groups. Um, just first of all, talking about and thinking about when was the first time that you realized a difference between the races? And that usually is a story. Um, it's a memory. And so we want to make sure that we take time and make time for everybody to speak. So kind of do the math when you get in your group to decide how many minutes people get so that everybody gets a chance to talk. And what adjustments have you started making just to do this work and read this book? Has there already been, you know, a, a, a way you're thinking or listening to news differently or something um, to get ready for or start this, this work? So I'm going to um, try my best to get us into groups so that we, um, we can do this work. And Ken and I will try to be in one in each group. 
And you should get an invitation in just a minute on your screen asking you to go to the breakout room. So give me just a moment and we'll get this set up for us. I might have to, I think I'm gonna to have to stop sharing. I think I'm going to have to add my name into one, but I'll get you guys into a group. If it takes a second for me to get in and I'm not in your group um, and, and Ken's not there, go ahead and get started. Okay. Oh. Oh, you say joy, right? <laughs> Okay. Okay, the other group's got a minute to wrap up, so they should be joining us in just a minute. How are we doing on the Zoom thing? Everything going okay so far? <laughs> yep. Yeah. I'm crazy. nobody's been kicked out from bad Wi-Fi or anything like that. Yeah, I just couldn't get in at the beginning because they kept telling me the ID number was wrong. Huh. So, um, did you just have to try it again, Katie? And it can't, it no, I had to get, I got the link from both Pat and Deb. Okay. Okay. Oh, and then, then I got right in. Okay. I set this up as a, um, recurring, recurring um, Zoom. So what you should be able to do is save that Zoom link and use that again right. for next week. Okay. Um, that, that should be the way that works. But if you have any problems, I, I'll make sure. Um, in fact, oh, good. We've got everybody back. Welcome back. Um, let's see. Let me, let me give you my cell phone number. Most of you have that, but if you ever need to text me, if you're getting kicked off or anything like that, um, that's e probably the easiest way to reach me, kind of like Katie did, and then we were able to get information to her. It's um, a Missouri area code, so you won't think it's a robocall next time you see it. 573-825-5500. Need me to repeat that? Or I can put it here, I can put it in the chat. Amy, come on, get smart. Use the tech. There it is. If you need and, to reach me. And, yeah. Neil? Um, I just wanted to bring something up. Um, Catherine, I did figure out where to where you can reach where you can rename your, your page. If you look at your picture, right in your pi little picture on our gallery screen. In the upper right hand corner, there are three, four dots. If you click on the four dots, it should allow you to, to rename. To, it should say mute, and then it says rename as one of their, your options. So you can rename yourself. And Lynn, you can do that too if you I, want. Okay. Or unless you want to stay as Steve, that's cool too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully, that was a, a helpful kind of door opening conversation for folks. Um, I enjoyed that time. Thank you for everybody doing that. Let me um, go ahead and get back to our screen share here. 
So here are um, some of the key ideas. So we thought, Ken and I thought that for about the next 20 minutes or so, um, we'd spend a little bit of time just on some key ideas from chapters one and three. So if you haven't had a chance to read or if you want to go back and read, you'll, you'll be able to take a look at some of these ideas. Um, and, and the reason we did chapter one and three first is because they kind of set a framework. Next week, chapter two is very pithy, um, really talking about white privilege and white supremacy and starting us into some of that work. So that's why we're uh, focusing on chapters one and three this time. But I'm going to go ahead and take the first two bullets, and then Ken's going to just do a little bit of a summary on the ideologies that are really important to understand as we go into this study. One of the first big ideas that D'Angelo talks about in Chapter 1 is this language, all people are created equal. Um, it's in our Constitution, but we know that when that was written, uh, what, who wasn't included in that statement? <laughs> White men. Most people. <laughs> yeah, anybody but white, white, white landowners. White <laughs> men. Right. White men were the yeah. ones included. Yeah. That's right. And so, you know, it, we, you know, we had, eventually, we had the ability for um, uh, white women to be included. Then we had the, the ability for um, the civil, ri civil rights acts, and then uh, African-American women. And, and so this is an evolving and emerging kind of a once and future reality for our nation. And what we'll often hear people talk about is, well, we're in a nation where everybody's created equal. <coughs> but we have to recognize that there's a storied history. And if, if you talk to Calvin Hill, who's one of our full-blooded <coughs> clergy in the Mountain Sky Conference up in Montana, he would argue that indigenous peoples still haven't um, no. gotten the understanding of being created equal in our country. So this is, a, this is an evolving reality. It's not, it, it isn't a historical moment where it all happened. And so we're living into a history and we're continuing to. The other uh, big idea that I was gonna bring is that the, our first challenge D'Angelo talks about is naming our race naming our race. What is whiteness? What is our understanding of whiteness? And one of the things that, that she mentions that, that is so profound is a lot of white people, if you ask them to talk about racism, they're willing to do that, but they don't start talking about whites, do they? No. If you ask them, one, what do you think about racism? They'll start talking about the other, right? Usually African-Americans, which generationally I was taught to be a much more inclusive term and sensitive term than blacks. But now we're learning through the Black Lives Matter movement that using the term blacks is actually more inclusive um, in this conversation of race right now in our nation than African Americans. Because there are black and brown people, but there are also within what we would call kind of the black community people who are not African, um, but others who understand a racial identity as a black person. So that even learning our language is important. But what, what D'Angelo does, and I think this is what makes her book somewhat unique from a lot of others, is she doesn't let us spend time first talking about the other. She makes us spend time in a space of understanding our own racial identities and what does it mean to be a part of a majority white culture. So that was another big idea that she brought to us. I'm going to move to Ken to your slides and uh, I can I can forward them as you speak to them if you'd like. Sure. Uh, so. I want to start with the word ideology because that's a word that D'Angelo, uh, I think, kind of throws out and then builds on that to make sense of what we're talking about in terms of racism. Uh, I'm not real satisfied this, with this, but I actually wrote this this afternoon. The ideas, beliefs, and philosophies that are shared by a group, which individuals learn from the group. Individuals sometimes reflect on these ideas, and sometimes they're just unconsciously used as the basis for our action. So th this is uh, the way that, that an ideology is the way that we 
look at the world the way we see it, what we expect to, to see, and uh, the way that we process the things uh, that we see or interpret and interpret the things that we see. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. So uh, we're going to talk just for a few minutes now about several examples of ideologies that D'Angelo lifts up uh, in um, this chapter one and chapter three, mostly chapter three now. In chapter uh, one, she looks at individualism and objectivity, colorblindness, aversive uh, activities and cultures. So let's start with individualism. Um, this, if you would ask many people, and uh, we, what is individualism? Well, that's just what America is based on. That's what we're all about, that each of us are unique. And then a big piece of the ideology, the understanding of individualism, is that because uh, we're each unique, we're not part of groups and we don't experience things as, and in the case of what we're talking about here, we don't experience things as, as Hispanics or we don't experience things as Native Americans or as Blacks, but um, we, we experience things as an individual. And therefore, since it's all just, we're all just individuals, then if someone fails, it's their own fault. It's the result of, the, uh, and, and what D'Angelo points out is that this has been one of the real corruptions of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, where he talks about judge, being judged by your character, is that that's, that's been transformed into, okay, all that matters is what's people's character, and, uh, and it discounts uh, what the experience that people have as part of a, as part of a group. Uh, I guess, should we just run through these? If you can mute if you're not talking, if you can just mute, that'd be helpful. Thanks. Um, but, and I guess, but we're a small enough group, and so that it's all right, too, if you want to interrupt. Um, I'm just going to run through. I've got a couple more slides here, and then, and if you want to, it's fine to add something or raise a, raise a question. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, objectivity is another ideology that she talks about, which I, I think this one is, uh, seems so often as if it's just the way things are, that there are best practices, there's a best way to do a job, there's one true way to, to know God or to worship God or the, the best way to uh, worship God. Uh, can you go back to the, there we go. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to uh, move my cursor. Hang on just a second, Ken. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and this is, this is kind of uh, the, the way to say, well, there, there is one reality and that every person would have that same reality. So if we're given the same information, we'll all come to an agreement about the way things are or the way things that should be. And like the beginning uh, quote that we had talking about the construction, the social construction of racism, that it's also the social construction of, of all of our experiences, that it comes not from uh, because there's something out there and we're born and we just start looking at things and figuring everything out. No, we're born and we have this social environment that teaches us how everything is and what the organization of society is or the organization even of things like science. There's been, um, since the 1970s, uh, an understanding that objectivity doesn't even work for saying, well, that's the way the planets work, that all of that is uh, the way that society um, structures our understanding of the world and even our understanding uh, of the physical world. And, and so once we say, 
that we're going to live because everything, you know, everyone would uh, be able to figure things out to be exactly the same way. We're missing the fact that um, everyone is not the same and that the uh, objects, the, the, the way that we experience the world is the way that we've learned it from our social environment and the way that we see things are from our social and, and that uh, therefore people who have different social environments are, are going to see things uh, differently. Do you want to go on to the next slide? Um, a, a topic that uh, D'Angelo talks about is uh, now we're moving to what's in the third chapter of the book is where she talks about some of the things that get in our way of being able to really talk about racism and to uh, understand some of the issues. Um, one of them is the claim that's popular with a lot of people of just saying, uh, well, under the skin, we're all red. Um, I don't see, I just see people, I don't see their skin color. Um, I, I don't see any difference. We, we all get up in the morning and, you know, we, we, um, we're the same uh, with, with just people. Well, the problem with that is, as she points out, is if we don't see race, then if we say we can't see race, then we're saying that it doesn't exist. And if we say that it doesn't exist, then we're not able to see it. And this denies us the experience uh, of having experiences of people with differences, but it also denies us the ability to actually see people as they are. If we just say everybody's the same, then we say, well, Black people don't have an experience that's different than ours, or Native Americans um, don't have a different experience. They're just like white people. And, the, uh, and it's actually denying, it's actually a denying of their personhood and who they are and what their experience is. The next slide. Um, aversive uh, racism is something that she talks about it. And this is based on um, a, a kind of natural, and I don't, I don't want to say natural, a common, that's a better way to say it, a, a common way that white people will avoid contact with learning about or experiencing other races. Um, I know in, in our breakout group, Amy, several people talked about the um, disappointment, I guess, in ending up living in Arvada and there are, uh, is not a contact with people of different races or different um, backgrounds. It's, it's surprising how many people came to Arvada from Iowa, like I did, you know, that, uh, that, that it's, and so, but, um, but this is, this is, you know, what, uh, that, White people, as when we avoid contact and learning about um, learning about other races, then it's it's a way that we deny uh, racism, and it, often often it's done with this uh, if claiming some kind of connection, and then that takes care of it. You know that, that then you know there's lots of um, you know, there's there's lots of Hispanics that work in the same company that I do. Well, if you never really uh, sit down and have lunch with a Hispanic, and if you never really uh, talk to them, or if you don't look at what's what's the role of Hispanics in the company, and are Hispanics been being promoted the same as as white people, and you don't think about that, then just saying, well, there's many Hispanics that work in my company. It's really this um, avoidance, uh, aversive. Um, behavior that results in uh, in racism not being not being addressed, and it it denies by by using excuses um, like oh you know, 
there's there are black people in my family or well i came from germany and and so i'm different from that and so on that that it denies any reason to recognize or address racism it's a, it's a way to avoid the conversation or avoiding more about learning more about um, racism uh, should we go to the next slide um, cultural racism this this is probably the one that um, is more core to all of our ex experience. Uh, this is the racism that children learn. Uh, as we grow older, it becomes much of it just unconscious and uh, often results in insensitive interactions because we don't even realize that this is just part of our culture, part of white culture is, uh, has a whole lot of racist content to it that is um, built into our culture and experience so we don't even uh, see it. Uh, so one example is the arts and, and TV. Let's uh, just sort of think about that for a moment. Um, uh, African Americans, I don't know, is it uh, a couple of years ago, started really calling attention to the fact that the movie industry was controlled by whites, that white actors were getting this parts, that there that there weren't directors that were people of of color, and that you know, all the awards for the best movies would go to to white people, and, and uh, I think. Um, uh, I'll speak for myself, that, that that's something that I, I wasn't just really thinking about all the time or hadn't just didn't notice it. And yet it was part of my culture that what um, what movies were, were part of a of a white culture. Um, and and the same um, happens uh, is now. I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to. I think more about this one that uh, it's obviously the schools are a place that does a lot of socialization, but that the schools themselves are designed around uh, an organization that then is justified uh, out of uh, white culture. Um, I'll just take one quick example on that, that um, in um, what's, what's, American schools generally are supporting that idea of individualism, that each person comes to, to name, the, uh, uh, to their, their own, be able to name their own needs, be able to name uh, who they are, what that is, that, that individualism. And um, then uh, in the uh, Hispanic families, um, and, to, to I, I like what D'Angelo does about, um, if, uh, says, well, when we group people and we talk about groups, um, we need to do that. And yet we also need to remember on the other side that there isn't a uniform, Hispanic is a good example of that, that people from Argentina are different in terms of their culture and their experience than uh, people from Nicaragua, um, but that uh, often the experience that children have coming from their home uh, is one of uh, respecting adults and uh, not questioning adults and of being, um, uh, being very, very respectful. And so you come to school and you're supposed to ask questions and you're supposed to, um, be challenging and instead, um, all of this is uh, not really necessary. So that's that's white. That's the way white culture is, and the way that we organize our organize our schools. Um, and and this cultural racism I mentioned, as we start out as children, we are taught the uh, often things that are uh, demonstrate that things that are white are better and that things that are white are the way television is, even if that's subliminal and we don't see that. But as, as young people, 
get older and become a little bit uh, more aware of racism or at least uh, racial differences, then much of the cultural racism will move backstage. And so white people will talk uh, uh, with each other, but then they're careful about what they say when they're in mixed company. And that, or if they, if they know, <laughs> I don't know whether Amy ever experienced this, but uh, people do this with a lot of things besides racism when the pastor comes around and the kind of language that gets used is, is, and even the topics are different when the pastor comes into the room than, than this backstage uh, talking and that's uh, racism can move, can move back into that uh, backstage where it's, uh, where it's, is it safe, where people feel safe to be racist in a sense or to express, uh, to express their uh, racism. Um, all, all of, uh, all of these things are, um, fall into a category that I find it helpful to think about what our goal is and what we're doing in, in these sessions in large part is working on becoming aware of racism. And for me, the image, the um, image is having a sense of racism, just like we develop a sense of beauty or a, a sense of what's good art or a sense of style, or uh, where we can't always tell all the rules, but, but we um, know what's pretty. And we know, um, even if we can't articulate uh, what what makes things uh, what makes things racist or the or the cause, we start to sense that there's something happening at the at the place that we're around or even in our church that we have that sense of okay, this is this is racism, and that some of these things that D'Angelo goes through in the first and the third chapter are kind of leading us towards increasing our of ability to lift up, uh, to, to internalize our constant vigilance in using our sense of racism. So I'll turn that back to you, Amy. Oh, Ken, thanks so much. It was a great summary and, um, and also some embellishment of the concepts that really help us kind of get a little bit deeper into them. I'd love, we're gonna move next to kind of what, um, what are we learning and I'd love to give us a challenge to that second bullet under cult cultural racism. Um, what messages, constantly sending messages to white people and their ways and ideas are superior. Um, I'd love to challenge each of us, and I'm going to take on this challenge, challenge too, to, to try to th find something this week um, that that is, is either a very subversive or very intentional message that white people in their ways and ideas are superior. So just kind of take that on as a challenge this week to, to find some of those examples. And I think that is a way of moving um, cultural racism from the secrecy of the backstage to the front stage where, like you were saying, um, Ken, where we get a sense of racism and it's a part of our, our sense of being now. Um, so let, let, we'll kind of take that on. In addition to these next, next, next steps, um, in just a minute, would love for you to use the chat box to, um, to just jot out um, real quickly an idea of what have I learned from this session or this reading um, and, and anything that, that you'll do this week. Um, differently or something that you'll do, even if it's, I'll get the book <laughs> and start reading. Um, that's okay too. But um, a part of education is not only, and we've got a lot of educators on this Zoom class, um, it's not just about filling our minds, but transforming the ways that we live our lives. And so if we can just take just a moment um, as we wrap up our session to go to the chat box, I'm going to um, come out of the stop share so that we can watch the chat. And again, if you go down to the very far right hand, first of all, you have to click on chat in the bottom of your screen. It'll get you into a chat box on the right side. And just at the very bottom, it says type message here. 
And if you want to just take just a minute, we'll be quiet for about a minute or two and just chat about anything you're learning or something that you'll do this week. Any others? Great, great do list. Have, do we have to click something to get it to go into the... Just push, just push return once you've typed down there, Lindy. Okay. okay. Except mine didn't have my name. It just says for me. Oh, mine says for me too. Why is that, I wonder? It's no, it shows up for the rest of us to see your name. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. On your computer, it shows up as just me, Katie. Know who to send. Okay. Who to send. okay. I guess I do that. <laughs> Y'all are rock stars. For whom, for whom has a Zoom life become completely new since COVID? For how many of you all? <laughs> Way to go. Look at that. that. That's awesome. You should be really proud of all the pivoting. Well, feel free to kind of let those let those chats absorb in us as we're not only thinking about our own um, activity and disciplines this week, but praying for others as they're taking some some new challenges on too. This isn't easy work, and um, I know one of the joys I have about doing this book study with you all is is I get to learn with you and grow from your wisdom too. So. Let me go back to the um, screen share real quick, just to wrap up here. It's a, we're here at our closing time. So next week on June 28th, um, we're going to be reading chapter two, which is um, a little bit of a longer chapter, real pithy, got lots, lots to learn from, with some illustrations from chapter 11. And then, like I mentioned, if you just um, save the Zoom link from this week, it's a recurring Zoom link, so it should be possible for you to be able to, to just click on that again next week. But you all have my cell phones and so, uh, or cell phone numbers, so if any of you um, have a problem getting in or anything, don't hesitate to let me know. And then I'd encourage you to, to tell some friends if um, you know that they might be interested in joining us and just couldn't this week or something to go to the website. Um, tomorrow, the, this, this class session will be up as well as the PowerPoint outline from tonight. Um, so yeah, just wrap it up. Katie, did you have something? Oh. Katie Johnson? Just wondered if you could restate the challenge you left us with to think about this week because I was trying to get it all written down and I- Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, let me go back. Um, let me go back to um, Ken's slide about cultural bias. Um, uh, there we go. Go ahead, Ken. 
Uh, do you want me to just read it? Um, in the arts, TV, schools, and other social institutions, cultural racism is constantly sending messages that white people and their ways and ideas are superior. So looking, looking for those um, unconscious or very overt ways um, that those kinds of messages are there. Yeah. Um, uh, how many you see on a daily basis? Right. You may, have, you may have seen um, that two products are going to have their names changed, Aunt Jemima syrup and Eskimo pies. Um, Uncle Ben's rice. And Uncle Ben's yeah. rice, right. Um, so, so and cream of wheat. And Mrs. Butterfield syrup. <laughs> yes. Butterworth. Butterworth. <laughs> so it's just an example of how, like. of how we have, we have a caricature, right? people of other race. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's just an example, but look for some more. Camille? Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask you, Amy, uh, so is Deb going to be ordering the books tomorrow? So that we can they, get- They've been ordered. They've been ordered. Um, the issue is it, they were supposed to be in two weeks ago. So as soon as I've got this, this class list now from our recording, so I'll have her send a group email out when we get them in the office. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, Amy, how about inviting people outside the church to join? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Please. Yeah. I've got some folks from other, my former churches who said they want to join. So, um, or even take the class by themselves and not be a part of our Sunday night if they have other things. So don't hesitate to get people sent to the direction of the website. Yeah. Arilla, did you, or I'm sorry, Catherine? Hold on. You're, you're muted, friend. Don't count us in for books, obviously. We're getting ours from Amazon. It'll be in July 2nd or 3rd. They've been on back order. Okay, okay. We're so glad you guys could join us from up north. That's great. Good. <laughs> uh -huh. any, any other closing thoughts or, or just questions, gang? Please don't hesitate to let me and or Ken know if this is a if this is a helpful kind of a, a model for our co our co learning with some breakout and some kind of some touching base on some core ideas. If there's some other ways that you'd like us to explore the material, help us help us know that so we can keep doing this better every week. All righty, my friends. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for learning and growing in faith tonight. Be well, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye, all. Stay healthy. You too. You too.